I invite you to remain standing as the word of God is brought to be read in the middle of our congregation, reminding us that this is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. This morning, we finished our sermon series, Faith in Film, and this week, we turn to the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Our scripture lesson comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. Paul writes, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will fully, I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Linda. Friends, let us go to God in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord, for you are this community's rock and redeemer. Amen. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood began in 1968, opening with this beautiful and familiar tune, Won't You Be My Neighbor? When the show began in the late 60s, it was never really expected to become a cultural icon or to be a lasting show the show it was filmed on a very simple set with literally all pun in, all pun intended only a handful of characters most of the characters were puppets given voice by the show's host Fred Rogers the show as I said never expected to really take off one of the show's producers said, if you took all of the things that make for bad television, a simple set, low production values, and an unlikely star, you have Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yet somehow, the show succeeded in major ways. This simple set, this low production value is very intentional. Mr. Rogers wanted it that way. He was unimpressed with the other television shows of the 60s, with their flair, with their fast-paced movement. And he felt like kids deserved better. They deserved something more simple. And so he started the neighborhood, and he invited children into the neighborhood week after week sharing simple messages in a slow way which children could absorb. And he introduced to them trusted friends who would guide them as they grew up with these lessons. And the show lasted far longer than anyone expected. The show lasted some 43 years, 31 seasons, and throughout its tenure, Mr. Rogers created 912 episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How many of you grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Okay, now, now leave your hands up just a moment longer. Don't worry, you're not going to be called on. Okay, good. I needed to do an unofficial poll. Even from, when our, with, from within our congregation, it's evident that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood touched the lives of two generations. Mr. Rogers had an impact on two generations of children. And so for countless children over those two generations, over 40 years, Mr. Rogers brought simple and needed lessons and became a friend to all those children who tuned in. Mr. Rogers passed away, Fred Rogers passed away 16 years ago 
in 2003, and his last show aired in 2001. It's 2019, and have y'all noticed how there has been this kind of resurgence of popularity for all things Fred Rogers and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood over the past couple of years? He's been, Mr. Rogers and his neighborhood have been the topic of articles and books commencement speeches which he gave in the 90s and early 2000s are going viral on the internet today 16 years after his death just this week the trailer went out for a new movie starring Tom Hanks as Fred Rogers entitled a beautiful day in the neighborhood it's set to hit theaters this Thanksgiving I received no, uh, no, no compensation for that plug. And Mr. Rogers has been the topic of documentaries like the one we watched this week, Won't You Be My Neighbor? In this documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, the, the producers and directors looked over the 43 years in which Fred Rogers was on television. Now, unlike other documentaries which tell us about that person, Won't You Be My Neighbor, instead of being a documentary about Fred Rogers, is really a documentary about the messages that Mr. Rogers shared, the messages that he believed, the messages that were at his core that were, re that were revealed over those 31 seasons. Now, some of y'all, when I said, how many of you grew up watching Mr. Rogers, you all shook your head? Neither did I. <laughs> I was one of those kids who was definitely drawn to the television that broke Fred Rogers' heart. <laughs> the flare, the pies in the face, the slime. And so I missed watching him growing up, but in this resurgence of popularity, I'm realizing that I... I miss something really special. Our nation right now just seems to be really taken with or obsessed with all things Fred Rogers, all things Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And since I missed out on it, I can't help but wonder, what is it about Fred Rogers? What is it about the neighborhood? What is it about this show in particular that brings it to such great interest some 16 years after his death, 19, 18 years since the last show. Is it nostalgia? Is it just that it was a beloved program for many of our childhoods? Is it just that he is so familiar, we loved him growing up, so we still love him today? Well, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is the longest-running te children's television program. The second longest children's television program is Captain Kangaroo. And I have yet to see a clip from Captain Kangaroo go viral today. <laughs> so is it just nostalgia that it was something beloved from our childhood? No other childhood program has aged as well as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But I think there is, there is some part of nostalgia at work in this, at work in our love for all things Mr. Rogers today. Because I, I'm thinking about the, the word nostalgia comes from the Latin word meaning to return back, to return back home from pain and suffering. I can see a little bit of nostalgia as we're watching Mr. Rogers because in the midst of the, the toxicity of our current embittered political divides in the midst of the ugliness that spews forth from computer keyboards and out across social media and in the midst of hateful rhetoric that's excused as punching back Mr. Rogers' soft, intentional voice hearkens us back. His soft, familiar voice 
comforts us. As our culture right now is busy drawing lines in the sand and pointing fingers at who's in, who's out, who's right, and who's wrong, Mr. Rogers' voice stands out, bringing comfort, serving as a as somewhat of a balm in our troubled times. One, com- one, one commentator, um, one journalist, or reviewer of the film pointed out that this movie, Mr. Rogers has become an obsession and this movie, this documentary did so well because Mr. Rogers' neighborhood is like a security blanket in troubled times. I think nostalgia is at work in the popularity of of this documentary and in the popularity of Mr. Rogers. But I think it's also a bit deeper. I think it's a bit deeper than just longing to go back to another time because we all know there was pain and suffering and great difficulties in the 60s and the 70s the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. There's another reason why Mr. Rogers' message resonates so much with us today. Mr. Rogers knew that children carried with them joy, laughter, curiosity, and silliness. All the things that we love about children and about childhood. But he knew that children also carry with them worry, fear, and anxiety. He addressed both on his show. He addressed their fears, worries, and anxieties, no matter how silly we may think they are. Like when he comforted a generation of children telling them, you won't go down the drain with your bath water. A real fear for children. When he comforted one little boy who remarked that his his stuffed animal's ear fell off in the washing machine. And Mr. Rogers comforted him saying, isn't it great that that doesn't happen to us? Our ears don't fall off. Our noses don't fall off. Our our arms don't fall off or even our legs. He addressed the children's fears, worries, and anxieties. He also addressed some of their deeper fears, worries, and anxieties. Especially the one that children have, that they're a mistake that something's wrong with them. One of the most beautiful scenes from this show was featured in the documentary, and it was when Daniel Striped Tiger, one of the puppets, said to Lady Aberlin in the land of make-believe, or in the neighborhood of make-believe, Daniel Tiger confessed to her, sometimes I feel like a fake. I feel like a mistake. He goes on, I'm not as strong as I should be. I'm not as this as I should be. And then he says, I'm not like anyone else I know. His friend Lady Aberlin responds to him, I really must tell you, I think you're fine just as you are. I like the person you were becoming. I like you just the way you are. She was, of course, echoing Mr. Rogers' daily or the regular affirmation to the children when he would always tell them, you've made today special just by your being you. There's no one else in the world quite like you, and I like you. I like you how? just the way you are. Mr. Rogers, he reached out to children 
but there was a certain brilliance to the way he reached out to children. He addressed the, the fears, worries, and anxieties of children all the while knowing that there were adults, there were parents and caregivers who were listening in to the conversation he was having with their little ones. For just as children carry with them fears, worries, and anxieties, and they need to be comforted, all of us, even adults, carry with us certain fears, worries, and anxieties. How many of us have found ourselves like Daniel Striped Tiger, thinking there's something wrong with me? I'm a fake. I'm a mistake. I don't know anyone else like me. And we have someone in our lives who responds, I really do think you're fine. In fact, I like the person you are becoming. I like you just the way you are. And suddenly, this scene that's in a neighborhood of make-believe becomes very believable, even for adults. Mr. Rogers' message resounds with us today because even in our rush to grow up and put all of our childish ways behind us, we all still retain fear, worry, and anxiety. And Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, believed that the anecdote to all of our fears, worries, anxieties, whether you're a child or a grown-up or somewhere in between, is love. He believed in the power of love. And so he regularly spoke about love. He believed that love had the, the, the power to change the world. and He said that the only thing that could change the world is love. When someone gets in their head the idea that love can abound and be shared, he said, that's when the world is changed. And he said the greatest thing we can do is help someone to know they are loved and capable of of loving. So Mr. Rogers speaks that message to children and adults who may feel unlovable, who may feel like a mistake. How many of us have felt that way even in our adult lives that we are a fake, we are a mistake? Perhaps it's we feel like we are a mistake because we look out and we see we're not like anyone else. We compare ourselves to someone else and discover that we just don't measure up to them. We're not as good as them. We're not as good as her, as good as her, as him. We can't do this. We can't do that. I'm not like anyone else I know. How many of us feel like we're a mistake because of our mistakes? because of our, our sins, because of, because of guilt, shame, and regret that we carry. To all of that, Mr. Rogers invites, won't you be my neighbor? It's an invitation into a neighborhood where love abounds and love is shared. It's an invitation it's an invitation into a place to know our value and to be invited to recognize the value of others, to experience love and to share love. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood resounds with us because of that comfort, but also for those of us inside the church, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood resounds with us because at some point his messages start to sound very familiar Love your neighbor as yourself. Faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of these is love. As I have loved you, so you too should love neighbors. 
Mr. Rogers didn't, didn't build his neighborhood off of just any old kind of love. His neighborhood was grounded in the biblical understanding of love because Mr. Rogers is actually Reverend Fred Rogers, an ordained Presbyterian minister appointed as a TV evangelist using a children's television show to share the good news of the gospel, to share the good news of love, hope, and compassion. There's a reason why his show is so popular. He's sharing the best news. And there's a reason why it means so us and strikes a chord so much with us in the church is because he is telling our story. I found it interesting to learn that the producers of Won't You Be My Neighbor went to Fred Rogers' widow to get her blessing before doing this documentary. She gave her blessing with one condition. She told the producer not to make a saint out of her husband. The producer wondered about this. He thought about it for a while and then realized what she meant. If he were to make a saint out of Fred Rogers, then none of us would have to try to live up to him. None of us would have to try to be like him. And Joanne Rogers knew that the world doesn't need to be emulating Fred Rogers, but rather living the messages he preached. She knew that her husband was always pointing beyond himself to the love of Jesus Christ. And she didn't want him lifted up, but his messages. So as we watch this film, as we find comfort in that familiar voice, may we also find challenge. May we be challenged by Mr. Rogers' message. May we believe that we are lovable and may we love others. May we receive the same invitation. May we offer the same invitation that's given to us. Won't you be my neighbor? Amen.